On Being a Pagan. Alanda Benoist. Translated by John Graham edited by Greg Johnson. 2004. Originally published in French under the title Comment Put en Etropion? Under the pen name Albine Michel, 1981. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 4, False Contrasts. So just what are the fundamental differences that separate European paganism from Judeo-Christianity? Before responding to this question a certain discretion is called for. Independently of the fact that an opposition is never as clear-cut in reality as it is from the, necessary, viewpoint of analytical convenience, it seems important to first avoid any reflexive usage of the very notion of Judeo-Christianity, which is the subject of controversy among both Christians and Jews and is not free of ambiguity. In all strictness, such usage only appears to be justifiable on two very specific planes. In the first place, on the historical plane, the Judeo-Christian are strictly speaking the first Christians of Jewish origin, members of the Palestinian communities of Nazareth who caused much discord between Judaism and Pauline Christianity. We know that Paul's success brought an end to this historical Judeo-Christianity. Next is the ideological plane, which involves the characterization of what Judaism and Christianity may have in common from the philosophical and theological point of view. Judaism and Christianity are the same fundamental theology, notes Claude Tresmontant. This was also the opinion of Jean Danielou, one of whose books is entitled The Theology of Judeo-Christianity. Christianity, in particular, has adopted all the universally applicable norms found in the Torah. Judeo-Christianity thereby designates purely and simply the monotheistic line of descent. That affiliation established, there is generally serious underestimation of the differences that exist between Judaism and Christianity. In practice this often leads to the attribution to paganism of features that supposedly radically distinguish it from Judeo-Christianity, and which in fact distinguish it only from Judaism or, as is much more often the case, from Christianity. In certain cases the oppositions are illusory in great part or only involve how certain terms are expressed and not the terms themselves. It has often been maintained, for example, that Greek thought was dynamic, concrete, and synthesizing an opposition to an essentially static, abstract, and analytical Hebrew thought. In fact it was certainly the exact opposite, as shown by James Barr, who correctly opposes the Greek type of thought, analytical, creator of distinctions and pieces, and the synthetic Hebrew type of thought. Furthermore, Semitic languages spontaneously lead to synthesizing in the concrete, partially lacking in syntax, they retain a vague nature that predisposes them to a multiplicity of interpretations. Other features that have been credited to Judeo-Christianity are in fact specifically Christian, the theological importance of original sin, the idea of a finished creation, devaluation of sexuality, disdain for life, and so on. This does not include the intolerance characteristic of Judeo-Christian monotheism, which assumed truly dreadful proportions in Christianity, first by virtue of the grafting of the Christian faith on the missionary spirit of the West, and because of the three great Abrahamic religions, only Christianity has set great store from the start in realizing its universalist vocation, wishing to be more than the religion of simply one people or one culture. Nor can paganism be denied an aspiration to the universal by boiling it down to an enclosed regressive subjectivity. But this aspiration to the universal, a point we will revisit, is derived from the particular, from beings to being and not vice versa. Powerfully manifested in Greek philosophy, among the Romans with the concept of the Imperium, the Indo-Europeans with the idea of empire conceived as the body of the god of light, the universal represents the crowning achievement of a social undertaking integrated with the being of the world, as well as the embodiment of its principle. It should not be confused with either philosophical or theological universalism, with their reduction of differences, or with ethnocentrism. Finally, any consideration of the establishment of Christianity in the West cannot dispense with a study of not only the external but internal causes for that establishment. What in the European mentality facilitated that conversion? Nor should it be overlooked that Christianity itself has evolved considerably and that from the historical and sociological point of view there is not one but several Christianities. For my part, I will overlook nothing of the distinction between the egalitarian and subversive Christianity of the early centuries and the, relatively, constructive Christianity, strongly colored by pagan organicism, of the Middle Ages. Fourth-century Christianity was already obviously no longer the same as that which provoked the fury of Acelsus. Nor are we unaware that, as Heidegger puts it, Christianity and the Christian life of the New Testament faith are not the same thing. Finally, I will not overlook the multiple meanings of the symbols on which the hermeneutic is exercised or the inevitable variability of the body of scripture and theological systematizations. When it comes to specifying the values particular to paganism, people have generally listed features such as these, an eminently aristocratic conception of the human individual, an ethics founded on honor, shame rather than sin, an heroic attitude toward life's challenges, 
the exaltation and sacralization of the world, beauty, the body, strength, health, the rejection of any worlds beyond, the inseparability of morality and aesthetics, and so on. From this perspective, the highest value is undoubtedly not a form of justice whose purpose is essentially interpreted as flattening the social order in the name of equality, but everything that can allow a man to surpass himself. For paganism, it is pure absurdity to consider the results of the workings of life's basic framework as unjust. In the pagan ethic of honor, the classic antitheses noble versus base, courageous versus cowardly, honorable versus dishonorable, beautiful versus deformed, sick versus healthy, and so forth, replace the antithesis operative in a morality based on the concept of sin, good versus evil, humble versus vainglorious, submissive versus proud, weak versus arrogant, modest versus boastful, and so on. However, while all this appears to be accurate, the fundamental feature in my opinion is something else entirely. It lies in the denial of dualism. Expanding on what Martin Buber said about Judaism, it seems that Judeo-Christianity stands out less for its belief in a single God than by the nature of the relationships it suggests between man and God. In any case, it has been a long time since the conflict between monotheism and polytheism was boiled down to a simple quarrel over the number of gods. Polytheism is a qualitative and not quantitative concept, Paul Tillich observed. The difference between pantheism and monotheism, Tresmonton acknowledges, is a spatial question, not an ontological one.